Welcome, everybody, to Joe's Disc Golf live stream podcast. For those of you listening, Friday, April 22nd, well, happy recorded. Welcome to listening to the recorded version of this. If you didn't happen to catch the live version, well, that is because I am starting at 9.51 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as opposed to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because of work. Yo, what up? My teams need to know how to finish in regulation, but that is neither here nor there. Welcome, everybody. Joe here with Joe's Disc Golf Podcast, and I have an exciting time, exciting stuff to talk about here. I have put off making a video about this very topic that we have coming up here. We've got so much to talk about. So much happened at Champions Cup. The winners, the losers, the drama, the Disc Golf Network. You know what I'm talking about. You who <coughs> may or may not have been paying attention and know exactly what the hell I am talking about here. <sighs> Man, so much to talk about, including match play. My very own match play match. Because matches in match plays are matching. Match my doodle dandy. But before I get anywhere, I got to talk about my sponsor, my fantastic, lovely sponsor, Log. What rolls downstairs, a loner in pairs, rolls over your neighbor's dog. What's great for a snack and it fits on your back? It's Log, Log, Log. It's big, it's heavy, it's wood. It's better than bad, it's good. Log from Blamo. Not a real sponsor. Insert real sponsor spot right here, yo. What up? You can tell I'm full of it today. I'm all full of piss and vinegar because. There's got some stuff boiling my blood like it hasn't boiled since Worlds 2021, and you know what I'm talking about. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you could talk about our former PDGA disgraced president, President Dumbass. I mean, sorry, Justin Minichelli, but it seems to be the board's um, MO to have people like that on there. So uh, without hesitation, let's just jump right in. To this main line topic, I feel hot takes a plenty here, but let's start with the not so hot takes. The winners on the MPO side, we had Chris Dickerson taking it down, winning it easily. The Woods master himself, he did a fantastic job. He looked great. I didn't get to watch as much of the uh, MPO coverage as I would have liked uh, because of Eastern family obligations. Uh, With this being Thursday, Friday at work, I can't really watch the MPO when they tee off just because timing, it doesn't work out that well. So I watch a lot more FPO. So I didn't get to see as much of that. I did notice that the plosives that I'm emphasizing, Pride Peer, in by Mike, holy crap, they need to do something to fix uh, the headset that I'm assuming they record out of the same studio. The headset that the color commentator uses that Philo and Elaine King used because holy crap, that was pretty awful. Uh, At first, I thought it was just on the FPO side that, you know, maybe the mic was adjusted wrong for Elaine King and it wasn't great. But no, when Philo, when I listened to Philo, it sounded pretty bad. The plosives were awful. So bad. And... I'm not a huge fan of Ian Anderson's commentary because it's not play by play. It's commentary. Um, To be fair, the guy does it for MPO and FPO for every single day. We need to get someone else in there to give the guy a break. Someone else cover MPO and he does FPO or vice versa, whatever, because we're not getting a great product when he does both. It is impossible to fully adequately prepare for both MPO and FPO to do the best that he can. So I I don't think he's getting quite a fair shake by having to do this. We've seen uh, Charlie Eisenhood do a fairly good job, I think, at least with with the Silver Series stuff. You know, call him up. See if he can do some, split some uh, play-by-play, play-by-play commentary because right now it sucks. He's not doing a great job. We're blurring the lines between color commentary and play-by-play and we're getting a diluted product because of it. So uh, that's kind of where I'm at right now. As you can see, I am in a no BS mood right here. <laughs> you can see that I am all full of it here. Ah, oh, come on, stupid. 
Okay, there we go. You should all go over to joesdiscgolf.com. You could take a look in the link in the description below or joesdiscgolf.com. Scroll all the way down to the bottom. You'll see a little link that says, buy me a coffee. Buy me a coffee is a great way to help support Joe's Disc Golf. You can throw me a dollar, two dollars, five dollars. You can make it a recurring monthly thing, or you could do an annual thing. You get two months free. What do you get for all of that money? You get the satisfaction of completing the game. No, that's not what you get. Um, you get the knowledge that you know that you're helping out Joe's Disc Golf. Unfortunately, I want to offer more. I do. But um, what everybody else offers, uh, and Buy Me A Coffee is kind of like Patreon. What everybody else offers is bonus subscriber stuff, bonus episodes, bonus this, bonus that. I have a full-time job, and I, I want to see my family. So unfortunately, at this time, I don't feel like I could offer more and offer um, extra stuff at a higher tier for you know more money. So if you feel, and, and what's great about buy me a coffee is if you want, you could just throw me a dollar and say, hey, good job. Here's a dollar. I found a dollar. I found a dollar. I found a dollar. Hey, 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 hey. Great movie. Great, great movie. Little rascals there. Um, enough of that. Uh, going back to what we were talking about here. Uh, so Chris Dickerson wins. I know I went on a commentary tangent, but I'm bringing it back, bringing it right back in. I found my sine and cosine after that tangent. And uh, Chris Dickerson takes it down, uh, fending off Ricky Wysocki, who also played very, very well. Calvin Heimberg, again, always a bridesmaid, never the bride. It seems like this year, he just, he can't quite get over the hump. I want him to. I want Calvin to win. I just, I like Calvin. He seems like a pretty cool dude. He's pretty dry, pretty sarcastic, at least from what I've seen. Seems like a little bit of a darker sense of humor. That's all right. I like it. It's pretty sweet. Um, but, you know, I want to see him win. Maybe he'll maybe he'll take down Jonesboro. I have him take in second. I have Ricky, Calvin, and then Gannon in that order. We'll see what happens. Uh, sorry, Rick, for picking you to win it. Uh, because I picked Paul McBeth to win Champions Cup. And we saw where he ended up there. Though he shot that hot 16 down. Holy macaroni, head over to his YouTube channel when you're done watching this, when you're done listening to this, because it just so happened to be someone had a camera on him looking to shoot some B-roll, decide to film the whole thing, and we saw history. Probably, oh, his first, I don't know, top, maybe second best, that Maple Hill round was bonkers, absolutely bonkers, but definitely top two is the 16 down at WR Jackson. Go watch it. It is the best disc golf I've seen. It's, 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 I, words, hard, talk, me, can't, good, watch, now, go. I, it, like, I, I don't know. Words are, words are so hard. It's, it's fantastic. Go ahead and watch it, like I said. Um, on the women's side, so much drama. Like, I was an idiot and wrote Paige off after the first day where she did not do well. She started with a triple bogey on hole one and then gets an eagle on hole 18 four rounds later and wins it all. Absolutely just wins it. It's It was insane. Uh, she wins it by two strokes. Uh, Kristen Tatar airballs one, unfortunately, and um, misses that, misses the comeback. Ends up uh, bogey, double bogey. I forget what it was. Uh, ends up giving Paige two-stroke victory. It was unfortunate. Um, you could tell with the way that interview went down, which more drama there, um, that Paige was already resigned to either a playoff or possibly she could have been ready for a loss at that point, which, I mean... It, either way, uh, and I'm not saying that uh, Kristen Tatar threw it away on that hole. She had, you know, how many holes? 72 holes total to come and win it. She had uh, her third round was meh. She could have shot a couple strokes better there. She shot great the first round, I believe it was. Second round was pretty good. Third round was meh. Last round, eh, she saw, shot one over. So she didn't shoot great the last two rounds. The first two rounds were pretty good. I, I, and And again, I'm, you know backseat driving here but uh, you know there are things that she could have done different obviously it came down to the end you got to play it all out 
and you never know what's going to happen. Something like that can happen. It just, it happens. That's, that's how it goes. Uh, so Paige Pierce takes it down, gives her a big hug after the interview she gave with, I believe it was Terry Miller right after her post round interview where she talked about the argument she had with her dad and what success looks like. It's, it was pretty interesting. How, how do you define success? Oh God, he's watching. I mean, hi RJ from half in the bag. How are you? Uh, we talked about this a little bit on half in the bag. So what good timing for you? Um, we talked about what success looks like for us in various things, whether that's disc golf or not. And for me, a lot of times with success, I have yet to win any sanctioned or unsanctioned tournament. So success for me doesn't, doesn't look like that. Success for me looks like going out and playing my game and hitting my lines. Like my best tournament so far was an unsanctioned tournament last year. And what was interesting was uh, tied for first going into the second round, ended up getting second place. And I was hitting my lines, but not hitting some putts there at the end. So for the most part, my first round was successful. I happened to be in first, tied for first, four-way tie for first. So we were all on the lead card. Um, after that, I ended up second. Uh, I, I didn't play well in that second round. I didn't do as well. Like I said, I was hitting my lines pretty decent, was missing my pots. So overall, I thought that was a su successful tournament because I played well. And as it's going right now in the match play event that I'm doing, I'm finding a lot of success through playing well. My putting has been amazing to like, I am shocked. I'm hitting 25 and 30 footers and I'm just going up with confidence and just banging them and you know what's really helped that practice wow practice makes perfect who knew who knew if you went out and threw say 100 putts a day you'd get better at putting who knew if you would focus on your putting form and work on consistency and work on your stance and work on things like that who knew you could get better i had no idea it's not like i work in athletics or anything i just mine blown uh, RJ asks, how big of a role does Paige's dad play in her pro career? That is a difficult question um, because, and I don't know the background too much. I'll be curious what they talk about in her uh, documentary coming out, her biopic, whatever is going on. I think, I think it's GK is producing it. It's one of those. It's not Jomez, but it's one of those like GK or Gatekeeper or one of those. Um, there, there's, it's out there. Um, it's, Page Pierce Fierce or something like that. Uh, I think it's called. I can't remember off the top of my head and it's hard to Google right now because my keyboard is off to my right hand side, 90 degrees. And so like typing one handed like that would be super awkward. And you don't want to look at the side of my head. You barely even want to look at my face. The side of my head isn't any better. That's why you're probably happy that you're listening to this in audio version. But um, I, I don't know. I don't know when it drops. I know there is a trailer that came out in the last couple weeks. Um, I think they're still working on it. They had to fundraise for it. The trailer, I didn't watch it. I've heard really good things about it. So hopefully it comes out soon-ish. I don't know when there's a lull. Maybe if there's a lull like around the time that like right before or after European Open when nobody's really playing here and... I'm looking at getting tickets to D-Glow because probably none of the pros are going to be there that are like Paul Macbeth and that kind of stuff. But that's neither here nor there. I think it's kind of a weird spot where she's kind of caught where I think her dad probably pushed her a decent amount. Uh, right, wrong, or indifferent. I, I don't know. I don't know the relationship. I know they had that that discussion, but how many times have we had a disagreement with our parents and, you know... It's just that one time, but whatever. And she said multiple times she still loves her dad. It's just, you know, you can have a disagreement and still love someone. Right, RJ? Love you, buddy. Um, any which who. Uh, it's kind of weird because I'm sure he was probably pushing her to go out and play and practice and doing that stuff. How much? I don't know. 
Um, how much did she want to go out and do disc golf and do that? Because clearly she loves it now. I mean, it's her career. If she hated disc golf, she would not be doing what she's doing or she would not be winning and, and, and continuing to play as much as she is. So it's kind of interesting. Um, I'd actually like to learn a lot more about that. It'd be, it'd be pretty cool to find out more how, how that happened. But, um, Really interesting interview. I highly recommend going to check that out. It's all over Twitter. I think we put it as the pinned tweet for Half in the Bag Disc Golf. But um, yeah, outside of that, let's see here. Let me move in a little closer here. A little closer to the camera so you can really get a, get a look at my ugly mug. We had a lot of drama happen at the Champions Cup. And the winners, the play was overshadowed from the get-go. Right off the bat, Andrew Presnell, I believe it was Andrew Presnell, tweeted out, Instagrammed, one of those, put it on social media, that you are not allowed to move any debris that isn't in your stance. If there is debris in your run-up, the PDGA says you have to do a standstill. I call baloney on that one. Because that's, that's a load of crap right there. Um, you're not allowed to move sticks or pine cones or anything unless it's in your stance. That is a rule that was put in place this year. It kind of slipped under the radar. That, from a player safety standpoint, is so stupid. And the way around that, which people have done so far, they did it, I don't know if they had to do it, but they did it in, uh, they did it in the tournament. You put your foot down where you'd stand and just lay down and then just make like a snow angel to up. Oh, that's anywhere where a point of contact could be. So I got to clear all this stuff out. Like, I don't understand the logic. Obviously, like they don't want you to clear out your run up. So I get not wanting to clear out a James Conrad run up because that's about 700 feet long. I get that. But within reason, like whatever you can reasonably move within your allotted time is, is how I think it should be. I don't think that how it's written now is good for player safety at all. And now it's a weird spot where it's like, well, you got to call that you got to do it. So you're not allowed to, you know, move a couple pine cones or something like that. You're not allowed to move some small sticks. I'm not saying you need to move this, you know, 10 foot long, eight foot around, log. That's stupid. That's insane. That's not what we're talking about. Anybody who's bringing that up, you're just an idiot. Sorry, I have no patience. <laughs> if you could tell today at work was a was a day, let me tell you. Uh, I, but I can't because of, you know, I like my job and HIPAA and all that stuff. But some frustrations are definitely coming out right now. And this is a great way to vent. But why? What is the logic behind that? I know this is partly based off of what Macbeth did at Worlds last year where he moved a log, but that log was technically part of the course. Like it was an edge barrier type thing. I don't know if it was clearly defined. It will, it will, it's just dumb. And they made this, this announcement about it in the players meeting right before the Champions Cup. And it's like, this is ridiculous. And I think it was also Andrew Presnell who took a picture of one of the tee pads that had like a stick on it or something and said, well, looks like I have to do a standstill for this tee shot. Like, I don't get it. We don't, we're not playing on perfectly manicured surfaces. This is not golf where you've got people paid tens of thousands of dollars to make sure that course is perfect pristine. This is disc golf. We're not there yet. Maybe 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the road. That might be a thing. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? I'd like to think we get to that point. Um, I'd hate to see the cost of playing at a course like that because you know that we'll charge. I mean, come on, like that will cost money. It will, but I digress. That's a whole different topic. Um, so the idea that that's stupid or that that makes sense, that rule, like I kind of get what they're going because what Macbeth did was not right. There's a story about Big Germ taking some guys from 
like in the spectator galleries to help move a log. That is obviously not what you're supposed to do. There needs to be some kind of middle ground. I don't know how, the, I don't know the best wording to define it. I, I know talk good. Me words find hard bad good. Or yes. The disc golf photography guy says, just stay out of the weeds and you'll have no issue or you won't have any issues. Yes, I guess. But then you play a, a course like W.R. Jackson and crap falls from the trees all the time. Um, all the like I just played um, Tillman Park, which is a wooded course. There's sticks everywhere in the middle of the fairway. Like, um, yeah, I know if I ever get on coverage, <laughs> if I ever got on coverage, if I ever got good enough to tour, if I ever got above a thousand, oh my God, I, you know, I'm happy with my 924 rating. I'm happy. I'm, you know, I'd love to be up right about 950, but there's no way. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I, uh, that's just, that's just, I kind of get what they were going for, but you missed it was, it was, uh, you went for that 35 foot jump putt and you airballed it. And now you're looking at a 32 footer. You can't jump putt this one back. Uh, you, I, we need to look at that. We need to change it somehow. I, I, off the top of my head, I don't know how, um, we also need certain rules specifications for things like what happened at, uh, was it the open at Tallahassee that had, or no, uh, what was right before that music city with all the thorn bushes everywhere. That was kind of ridiculous. I like, I don't know. Um, looking at my concurrent viewers and stream numbers here. Uh, I realized that, um, somehow, thank you, YouTube. One of the settings left my stream last week. And I think the week before as unlisted. So thanks YouTube. I appreciate you. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, anyway, you. Speaking of Elaine King's, I seem to be watching everyone like a hawk. Uh, okay. I wrote an article about this. I didn't jump on the wagon as soon as this happened. As soon as this came out, I think it was Monday. This all started with a post from Kristen Tatar who was essentially praising her daughter for being so strong and brave during a crazy situation that happened there. Um, that, uh, okay. Going back real quick. I just want to read this comment here. Uh, I imagine safety would rule over all, but they just want to maintain the sanctity of our ecosystem so we can continue to be able to, place courses in the woods without affecting it negatively. Yes, uh, but the sticks that fall, the branches that fall in the middle of the fairway, I think are fair game to toss off to the side. Um, I, The fact that they're telling you just throw a standstill, they're telling you how to, how to throw, how to pick your shot selection, which is, I, I don't think we're there. Like, I don't think that's right. Um, that's just where I'm sitting with that. Um, I was Boy Scouts forever, um, Eagle Scout. So I get, you know, take only photographs, leave only footprints to a certain extent. Um, yeah, exactly. I No, I'm with you. I think we're on the same page here. It's hard because I have to wait for you to type and respond because, you know, there's a delay and all that stuff. I think we're on the same page. Um, I think, you know, dead and unattached is fine. Going out and breaking small trees uh, there's a couple courses that have trees that are like an inch thick. Don't go and break those. That's just stupid. Um, I hate honeysuckle. It is the bane of my existence at two of the courses that I play a lot, but you can't get rid of that. It's part of the course. It's fine. I get it. Although one course is maintenance. Um, the university maintenance has basically taken out all the honeysuckle. They said it's an invasive species and it completely changed one hole from being a rather difficult forehand shot to a rather stock forehand shot. It was like this big hyzer, but now it's a pretty straight shot. Um, yeah. So yeah, we're on the same page, 
But moving on to the other part of the drama that happened, um, as I mentioned, Kristen Tatar posted saying how brave and strong her daughter was. Um, she was next to her, um, I believe, for part of the part of the round. Um, it sounds like this was only in the final round, not all of it. Uh, like there's some conflicting information out there. I believe she's only around Kristen Tatar for that part. And because she's under 13, she couldn't be the caddy. And because she's under 13, she needed adult supervision that wasn't Kristen Tatar. Those are the two rules. Um, 302, 303. Uh, either way, whatever. So, but here's the thing. Nobody knew the rule. Right or wrong, that's, uh, that's a different part. All the pros should know the rules. But none of the PDGA staff that were working this event, none of the tournament directors who were running this event, none of the players on the card working this knew this rule. We're going to enforce this rule because they didn't know it. They weren't paying attention. On top of that, what made things a little weirder is even though Kristen Tatar's daughter is nine, she was incredibly well behaved, which that's pretty awesome. She wasn't getting in the way. She wasn't doing anything. Um, I did listen to, so that happened. Okay. So what happens was in coverage, I believe Elaine King mentioned something about her daughter helping her out or being her caddy or something like that. So she couldn't officially be her caddy. Um, and you know, uh, so she couldn't be there. Couple questions here that I haven't found an answer to. How did her daughter get the caddy badge to be able to be there do the tournaments and I'm not singling out champions cup and the tournament director there. I'm not singling him out. I, I, if this, if anything, I believe this is probably happening all across the board at all the pro tour events. Do all the players when they check in, just get a packet. Like here's your badge. Here's your caddy badge. They don't do, there's nothing like, yes, my caddy is John Smith, you know, whatever here's my caddy kind of thing. There's no check-in for the caddy. So that could be something that could change in the future. You know, some, something like that. I know some of the pros have talked about, like they don't always have a caddy or they'll go to a town and they'll have two or three friends there and someone different will caddy every single day. I think that's fine. I have one caddy per day, but you go like, Hey, you know, round one, uh, Jimmy's caddying for me. Round two, Susie's caddying for me. Round three, Billy is caddying for me. It's something like that. That's fine. You get some basic information about them. Make sure everything, make sure they're, they're older than 13. That would have solved all these problems. I have rallied against breaking the rules so far. Like, I think it is a stupid uh, rule for the clearing it. And I would be hesitant to call it, especially giving my job. Part of my job is to eliminate as many potentials for injuries. Like technically we're always supposed to go out and walk the field to make sure that there are no holes or anything and try to get them filled. That is my job as a sports medicine professional, as an athletic trainer. So that rule just blows my mind on so many levels. And I've rallied against like, you know, Nico isn't the only one. He's just happens to be the best player who does this and Gannon too, although he has gotten better the 32nd rule. Now with this, this is something nobody knew what happened, what transpired. There's a couple different versions of this that I've heard. Supposedly what happened was, and this is from, Oh, this interview. If you are into torture porn, watch Smashbox and watch this interview because, Oh my God, it's awful. Um, it is, a PR extension of the PDGA and disc golf network is Smashbox TV for this interview. Uh, I don't watch Smashbox or listen to Smashbox all that often. Um, I know a lot of people respect Terry Miller. Um, I think one of the general issues with disc golf media, broad general thing, is this is like a good old boys club. Everybody knows everybody. Nobody wants to hold anyone's feet to the fire. So when, uh, say the guys at foundation make 
a hot take or just give their opinion. People are quick to defend whatever and like go against them because they, yes, they know Brody. Yes, they know Paul Macbeth and a handful of other pros, but they're not afraid to just say whatever it is being more like a sports analyst. I don't know any of these pros. I, with the rate I'm going here and the friends I'm making against the PDGA, <laughs> the people I have torched, uh, I called out last year, Justin Minichelli for the BS he said against Paige and Brody and that whole situation at Worlds. Total crap. Calling out Elaine King, I am not making any friends and I don't care. I'm here to give my opinion, give the an, uh, analysis and if you don't like it, Sucks to suck, but you're a public figure. I'm a public figure. Roast me. Torch me. I don't care. I've probably had some awful takes in the past, and I will have some awful takes in the future. I try to make the most informed take, and I have waited to talk about this topic to get as much information as possible. So what ended up happening was Elaine King sees this. Text Paige Pierce's caddy. They're friends somehow. I don't know. Whatever. I don't care. Text her. Apparently she... Elaine King says that she saw that and then show Kristen Tatar. Another report says that she also texted the president of the PDGA, I think it was, or the guy in charge of IDGC. Um, I, I don't remember exactly. Uh, I'm a little fuzzy on the other person. It's someone important at the PDGA, whether it's president. I don't think it was the president, um, but someone important there just said, tell Paige's caddy to look at her phone. Um, and then she looks at her phone and then goes to talk to Kristen Tatar. One of the other interviews I saw that Paige Pierce did, uh, I don't remember who it was with, um, Nick and Matt show maybe? Paige got irked by the fact that her caddy went over to talk to Kristen Tatar. Now that's kind of like, because as Paige explained it, she only wants her caddy, whoever it is, to talk to her when she's in the right headspace. And I can completely understand that. If... You know, anyone like RJ, if you're still watching, if you're my caddy, there's only certain times I'd want you to talk to me. And that's if I'm in the right headspace. Half the time, it, I know when I screwed up and what I screwed up, probably. They're pros. They 110% know what they screwed up and how they need to fix it. If I know, they definitely know. So just going to put that out there. So she was bothered by that because she saw her caddy talking to Kristen Tatar without Kristen Tatar like going, hey, you know, whatever, just saying hi or whatever, I, whatever, just starting the conversation. Like basically, caddy, caddy should be seen and not heard type, type mentality, which is, that's whatever. That goes down. Kristen Tatar is a little concerned. Uh, she texts her partner, Silver. They get in contact with the assistant, assistant tournament director and the tournament director, you know, I think Elaine King said that she could possibly be disqualified. Tournament director said, no, that was never on the table. Never, ever on the table. Never even considered. When you look at that rule, there are no, there's, there's no um, penalty. There's no punishment at all. There's no punishment at all for breaking that rule. Now it's up to the tournament, dis tournament director's discretion. Like he could disqualify you for wearing a purple shirt. Like, would that be good? No. Would that tournament director get a lot of people for future tournaments if he's just, you know, randomly DQing people? No. It'd be he, she, whoever would be a terrible tournament director. So uh, that was never on the table. What they ended up doing was getting her into the gallery. Paige Pierce's caddy was local, so knew some people, got some people to watch her daughter. Tournament staff got her a sign for the quiet sign. So she was able to be right up there, 20, 30 feet away, almost right up there next to her mom. So that's that whole situation ended up resolving itself fairly well. Like all things considered, you're nine years old in a foreign country, and I'm guessing she doesn't speak English or if she does, it's incredibly limited. So um, I appreciate the honesty or watching for the honesty. Um. And yeah, uh, Elaine King made a ton of excuses. Um, the, the first thing that came to mind watching this was right off the bat, she was pushing the whole, 
we make all of our disclosures of conflicts of interest. And the PDGA is so good about disclosures of conflict of interest and all this and that and blah, 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 blah. And the more she said that and the more that came out, she really hammered that point home. It was like the first 10 minutes of the interview. And it just, it, it, the first thing that came to me to mind was methinks thou dost protest too much. Um, and she's trying to save face and trying to spin it and trying to have the best PR possible. And what would have helped out the whole situation is if the PDGA or tournament staff or disc golf network or all three came together and said, here's what happened. A to B to C to D. And I think this would have been not necessarily swept under the rug, but just far less, way less of a big deal than it has been. Um, but she just like, she says that it wasn't with malicious intent because she saw Valerie Jenkins get DQ'd because her caddy, Valerie Jenkins caddy had a beer in his, in the bag. And because caddies have to follow the same rules, dress code, you can't drink, you can't smoke, you can't do any of that stuff during a tournament, automatic DQ. She said she was worried about that. I, <laughs> is how I feel about that. Um, to translate, I think that's a load of crap. Um, it just, as a color commentator, as a commentator, play-by-play -play color commentator, guest analysis, whatever, whatever you want to call it, you should not be able to affect the tournament, the sport, whatever you're commentating. If, I don't know, Stephen A. Smith is calling a game, he doesn't, but I can't think of anybody else, and he texts Phil Jackson because I just watched the last dance with the Bulls, and he texts Phil Jackson that the Utah Jazz and Carl Malone is, you know, doing something not by the rules, and then, you know, Phil Jackson goes, hey, 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 and now all of a sudden there's a technical foul, they get some free throws and all that stuff. What if, what if Paige's caddy didn't have, or Paige, have the best, well, it sounds like Paige Pierce didn't really know about this at all from the interview she gave, so I could see that potentially happen. It, it looks like it looked like when she replied, she was honestly as blindsided as the rest of us. So I'm giving her a little leeway there. Uh, but what if she didn't have the best of intentions? What if instead she went to the tournament director or assistant tournament director or any tournament staff and go, hey, Kristen's got an illegal caddy. What do you do then? Which, you know, I mean, technically it was an illegal caddy. There's no rule specifically for or there's no punishment for that is it a courtesy violation is it a warning of some kind is it a stroke penalty dq it is up to the td's discretion uh, i think it'd be a pretty crappy move if he did dq her but i could have seen a warning just as e easily happen as the situation did unfold um uh, i i saw people calling for her to step down from the pdga i don't think that's a good idea at this point. I don't think she should be color commentating. I thought she does okay, but as she said in her interview that a lot of people in the PDGA and disc golf wear a lot of hats because she's sponsored by MVP. She's the vice president of the board of directors on a bunch of committees. I mean, whatever, like those committees all change uh, the, where I work. I'm on committees like whoop de doo um, but all part of the PDGA on the disc golf network as a commentator also writes for disc golf magazine, part of the PDGA that comes out quarterly. I don't really read it because nine times out of 10, all of those articles have been already posted to the PDGA website and it's just a waste of paper and money, but I digress. <sighs> so I don't think she should be color commentating. I don't think she should be texting people like that. Like I know people brought up the whole thing, like, the PGA, regular golf, golf ballers, used to be able to call a hotline and say, I saw Tiger Woods do X, Y, and Z on hole three at the Masters. I saw Bubba Watson do A, B, and C on hole 17, you know, and they could call that and retroactively add sanctions. I think that's a terrible idea. I don't want that at all. But if 
Elaine King is going to call a caddy violation like that. Why wasn't she calling 30 seconds on some of the ladies out there? And I'm, I'm only going to look at FPO. Why wasn't she calling some of the caddies that we could see that weren't following the rules? On the MPO side, you had Chris Dickerson's wife, who she does do some media work. She She's a photographer. So she could have been there in media capacity. She didn't have a camera with her. She was probably there as Chris Dickerson's caddy. She didn't carry his bag. She was wearing a tank top, which is a rules violation and a courtesy warning. So why didn't someone give her a polo shirt or a jacket or something to cover up because she was in violation? Um, somebody else, I think it was Nathan Queen's caddy. His name was like Steve. And it's like on the front, it said, my name's Steve. And just on the back, it had his picture. I know I got the name 110% wrong, but you're not allowed to wear a cotton t-shirt. Was Calvin Heimberg, was that shirt he was wearing? a cotton t-shirt or was it a dry fit shirt? Because uh, they call it, they said like dry fit performance, stuff like that. You can wear that as a t-shirt, but you, know, you can't wear cotton. God forbid you wear a cotton shirt. How dare you wear cotton? You can wear a collared shirt. Ladies can wear uh, shirts without the sleeves as long as they're like that tennis style uh, dressed kind of like Kristen Tatar was or um, Sarah Hokum. You could do that. Um, so that... That was, that's my problem is like, if we're going to do that, why aren't we calling other stuff that matters? Like, I get it. Kristen Tatar even said she took ownership. She's like, I should have known the rules. I should have known that my daughter who is nine years old couldn't have been there. No one questioned that. And yet we're still, we're all here watching going, all right, Nico, let's set the sundial. Your turn to putt. Like you know, people moving sticks out of the way because it's in their run-up and they can't do that. Why was nobody called on that? Is Philo going to start like, you know, texting Paul and go, hey man, or no, Calvin, because they're both, uh, they're both team Innova and go, Calvin, hey, you know, you, you better watch Paul because the last, last two throws, he foot faulted, his foot touched his mini in his, in his throw before the disc was released, you know, is that what we're going to get to? That's absolutely insane. That's stupid. That's awful. We need, and in my article I wrote, and I'm working on a follow-up piece. I'm trying to get through that, that interview. It is brutal. Uh, but I want to make sure that I get all the facts. I'm only about halfway through. So, you know, uh, I need a lot more whiskey to get through it. Trust me. But, uh, with that, like we need marshals out on the course. Um, we need someone, we need that impartial referee that everyone can yell at. You look at football, you look at basketball, and you go, that referee was terrible. The players always complain. They don't go like, they don't go up to a guy like he, you know, he followed me and like, why are you following me? He goes, they go up to the ref and go, why aren't you calling that? You know, that kind of thing. Or, you know, in football, you know, why didn't you call that face mask? Why didn't you call that block? Why didn't you call this? Why didn't you call that? And Baseball, arguing balls and strikes, out. Like, why don't you do that? We need marshals in disc golf who are not going to be afraid to know all the rules inside and out and go, hey, you can't do that. I'm not saying you need to be nitpicky, ticky tacky, all that kind of stuff. I just want the big violations at this point. I want the guys who take 80, 90, 100 seconds to take a putt. It's a 30 second rule. I, you know, you go, you come up, you address your lie someone has a stopwatch in the back, you know, let, you know, maybe let them finish out, go, Hey, there you go. You went 35 seconds on that one. Speed it up next time. This is your warning. Or another approach I saw, or I heard about, uh, was, you know, if, a, if there's a significant gap ahead, like there's three, four empty holes ahead between groups, the marshal comes up to the group and says, Hey, you guys need to pick up the pace or I'm stroking all of you. The whole card, whole nine yards. So you're not singling out one person, you know, that kind of stuff. Or if you have, if you notice your group is playing slow before a marshal gets to you, you can go, hey, guys, we got to pick up the pace a little bit. We don't want the marshal to yell at us and, you know, stroke us. You, you don't have to single out any single person. You could just go, hey, guys, you know, God, that marshal, he's a dick. You know, you don't have to worry about other players calling it because I get it. It's awkward. You are with these people nine months out of the year. Half the time, you're sharing 
uh, an Airbnb, a hotel room, a whatever, or you're parking your van right next to each other. It's crazy. I get it. But we need to do something. Uh, I don't know how many marshals we need. It probably would vary course to course. Something like uh, Jonesboro, you have clusters of holes where you could have one marshal cover three or four holes easy. And in that case, you might need four or five marshals, and that's about it. Other courses like Deglo, you would probably need more, or you'd need carts. You I, and you have all those marshals have walkie talkies. They're connected back up to base to wherever Tournament Central is, and then you talk in like, "Hey, you know, uh, I just you know gave a, a a time violation warning to you know the card that has uh, Brody Smith, uh, Calvin Heinberg." Uh, Chris Dickerson and Chris Clements. I don't know. I just pulled out random, random names there. And so that could be relayed back. And so they know like the next time someone comes up and goes, Hey, I just gave a warning to that same card. They could go, there was a warning already issued stroke them whole card or whatever, that kind of thing. There you go. That would potentially solve a problem and work things out. Like I get it. Sometimes it takes a little while to, to find your disc and that kind of stuff. Um, So let's see. Um, The disc golf photography guy says, I've met her and she's super nice. And I filmed uh, her myself and seen how professional she is, but she should have been briefed on her limits as a player versus a commentator. Yes, I agree. And that's, that's the problem is we're not separating these lines of you are a commentator and that's it. You can point out like, oh, hey, you know, Nico's taken 45 seconds to putt. You can let people know that is a fact. That is part of color commentating. You could say, oh, it looks like Kristen Tatar's daughter isn't quite old enough to caddy. I wonder if she knows the rule and just kind of leave it out there in the ether and or don't say anything at all if you're concerned about that. Um, she kept saying over and over and over again that she was coming from a place of, um, like a good place to say it, but it just ended up causing way more problems than it should. And it's making everyone kind of question why is a board member also a commentator, you know, and texting the caddy of, arrival at the time i don't know they were tied or it it was one stroke at most maybe two strokes difference between the two like so that really could have affected things hugely affected things it doesn't seem to have affected things um and she even goes she even said like hey then next one she birdied and then birdied and birdied or something like that but it's like that doesn't excuse what you did So at the very least, I need an apology. I haven't heard one yet. Uh, Again, I haven't gotten through all of Smashbox interview, but we'll see what happens. Um, I don't doubt that some of these people are nice people. It's just, I've never met them, so I can't say either way. I just know what I've seen out right now. Um, And it's kind of a jerk move to quote the (laughs) the previous president. Uh, It's kind of a jerk move right there. Uh, to say the least. So I think what we all need to do is just uh, what the, the disc golf network and the PDGA need to do is really delineate these rules and go, you are a commentator. Forget everything about being part of the PDGA. If you can't do that, we can't work with you. You know, that kind of thing. Sorry, it sounds harsh, but that's what we need to do. Crap like this is what's going to keep us from being seen as a more legitimate sport because we just had a color commentator essentially call a rules violation that got enforced saying that there's a rules violation. You know, maybe there's some obscure rule like every third Tuesday of the month under a blue moon, you can't actually throw a green colored disc up. Oh, looks like Paige Pierce has got a, a warning on her hands because she just threw a green disc. You know, if you're doing something like that and not affecting, not talking to anyone there. Okay, cool. Doing that, again, I feel like I'm going, I'm beating a dead horse on this one and just saying like, 
it went over the it went it crossed the line essentially i think that's where i'm at now um as disc golf photography guy said but it's still in Kristen's head being called out for such a juvenile violation on what elaine herself said was just uh the thought that Kristen might not know the rule and was helping her yeah it's it's kind of crap in my opinion as well I think we're again I think we're on a similar page here it's it's crap she thought she was helping but uh what's the saying the road to hell is paved with good intentions um I'm not saying that either person is going to hell uh but you know it's it's a saying for a reason uh so uh I think I think it just needs to be I think we just, she needs to, PDGA, Disc Golf Network, Disc Golf Pro Tour, I mean, those two are essentially interchangeable, needs to just take this as a learning experience. And I said in the article, I think we need to go through the rule book, start over from page one. I'm not saying throw it all out and reinvent the wheel. I think there are a fair amount of rules in there that are fine. I think we need to look at the rules and go, all right, you know, clearing your running lane for a run up. That's okay. I think that's okay. I think we should go back to it. You know, if it's part of the course, if you can't move something by yourself within a very short allotted time, then cool. Uh, I think the rules exam, I've taken the rules exam. It's a joke. It's open book. It's 10 questions. And they're like the most obvious questions that I had. I don't know if there, if it's randomized, if there's like Maybe it was 20 questions, whatever it was. Um, but they were all like super obvious. And I don't know if it's like, oh yeah, it's these 15 questions, but you know, you the, it's a rotating pool of like 45 questions or something like that. I thought all of them were just like, you know, this person threw out of bounds and then they did this. How many strokes is that? Okay. Like, Really? I'm not saying that you have to have it absolutely memorized, but if you look at it going into football, if you go into baseball, if you go into basketball, by the time you get to the professional level, you know those rules pretty darn well. You might not have everything memorized because you're not a, a referee, but you know what you can and can't do for the most part. Now, there are some obscure rules that you know get fallen by the wayside because they're some rule from the 1950 that they just never got rid of. And it just hasn't really come up in the last 30, 40 years. So that happens. Um, yeah. Uh, another comment from Thomas saying it, it appeared that on 17 page was in the water. She marked her disc and the marker moved when she stood behind it. Is that a penalty? It seems like a foot fault to me, but I don't know. Um, if your marker moves, I think there's something about that. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I really can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, and it's probably happened to me. Uh, could be a fault because uh, you haven't securely marked your lie and maintain it through your throw. Potentially. Um, it'd be interesting to see how that rule applies and which which rules apply. I want to get better at knowing the rule book. Um that's one of my things. Like, I really think we need to get more people who know the rule book and not just like, oh yeah, I play casually and I know this, or I've played, you know, pro tours and you know, the basics like we all do, but you don't know the nitty gritty. Um, as I said in the last podcast, the more, you know, the rule book, the more you could even save yourself strokes. Um, I had to clarify to, because I did a, an episode on this, I had to clarify on one of the cards I was on about the new OB rule. And the guy was half half in, half out. So he's in bounds. And he said, oh, I could take it anywhere along the arc. I said, actually, you can't. The rule for that, because you're still in bounds, is you have to take it perpendicular to the OB line. If you went completely out of bounds, then you get your arc. He believed me right after that. He was a good guy. And I would have, I don't know the rule number off the top of my head, but I would have been able to just go, oh yeah, here you go, rule 80 something, because the player's manual is all in the eights. So it's 80 something here, OB, blah, 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 right here. Here it is. You know, I'm not trying to screw him. I just don't want him to misplay. And I'm trying, I don't, I would, 
I've, I've had somebody tell me like, Hey, yeah, this is how you do this. This is how you do that. Like I've made mistakes. I have, it happens. We're all human. And, um, also asking for clarifications also helps asking if your stance is legal is not a bad option. Uh, there's one time I thought my stance was legal because of the awkward footing I had being on the side of a hill. And they told me, Nope, I had to turn. I had to bring my left foot back like another six inches. So that was, you know, that's not a bad thing either. Um, what would have happened if she just said it on commentary? We would have probably talked about it and been like, wait, that's a rule because that was a new rule change for here. And I don't think it would have blown up into the big issue it was. Honestly, I think what ended setting up everything in motion was uh, Kristen Tatar's Instagram post, which had nothing to do, had no malice towards Elaine King or the PDGA or Pro Tour or anybody, but saying how strong and brave her daughter was for being by herself with a stranger in a foreign country and probably not knowing English or knowing very little English. Um yeah. Yeah, it's it's a weird spot. I mean, some of the pros are still learning. A couple years ago, she could have made this post and it would have been liked by a few dozen people, maybe, and probably maybe not even talked about. Who knows? But now you've got people like me, like Foundation Disc Golf, like dozens of other YouTube channels and podcasts out there that are watching pros social media is trying to find things out. I'm still waiting to find out about Eagle shoulder. And if he got that stupid MRI, if anybody's got any information on that, I'd love to know it because I haven't heard a word. And, uh, he looked like he was playing all right this past weekend. Um, I said that he, um, um, he wouldn't finish in the top 10 until he gets it fixed. Whatever fixed is, whether that's, uh, a better rehab protocol uh, he talked about PRP, stem cells, that kind of stuff, or surgery. I don't know. I'm not a surgeon. I'm not his doctor. I don't know what's going on with his shoulder, other than he probably has a torn labrum. But that's a whole different. It's a whole different rant. And I've been talking for almost an hour now, so <laughs> I had to look to see how long I've been recording. We don't have time for that rant. Um, it really seems. Uh, Thomas says it really seems like some of the rules are randomly applied. Yep, and that's why. I titled the article Kristen Tatar and the selective application of, of the rules. And that's, that's what this is. Like if, if we're going to apply the rules, we have to apply all the rules, the good ones, the dumb ones, everything in between, or we don't enforce everything. We can't like, what's to stop someone from saying like, you know, I don't really like my lie. So I'm just going to move it three feet to the left. Are we going to enforce that rule for a misplay and changing your lie like that? You know? Um, yeah, she did say that. Uh, she said it was to prevent a rules violation from occurring. Um, but my problem is she's the color commentator and she has nothing to do with that tournament. The only person who can, the only people who can call a rules violation are the card, the tournament director, and then anyone the tournament director um, designates assistant TDs and, and the such. Um, yes, I've taken, I've taken the certifying exam because I had to see how stupid it was. And it was so stupid. I forget. Is it what? 10, 15 questions. It doesn't really make sure you know the rules. It makes sure you know the basic rules. What happens if you go out of bounds? What happens if you miss the Mando? Johnny threw three throws and then went out of bounds and then he came back in and then he two putted. How many strokes did Johnny take? Seriously? Like, I mean, I, I, I will say I have before miscounted on a hole because of um, my lie ending up being in the water and I took the stroke back and I was like, oh yeah, it was four throws and it was four throws, but it was five strokes. And somebody's like, are you sure? I was like, yeah, it was one, two, three, four. He's like, you also went in the water. I went, you're right. I did go OB. I was not trying to screw anyone. I was not trying to, to pull one over. I legitimately was only counting my throws, not my strokes, which is, you know, generally the same thing, but not always. So also good to pay attention on your card. Um, like I said, my solution for this is we need marshals and it's going to be hard right now 
because you're going to have to pay someone some kind of money, whether that is getting there early and having whatever the tournament staff is, find people in the local club and pay, test them, test them hard on all the rules and make sure they're following it. And you're going to have to pay them or you're going to have to hire some more pro tour staff to be able to be marshals at all the tournament stops, which is also going to be difficult. I get it. You know, you could do it like, you know, umpires or referees or whatever and get train up, you know, 50, 60 people and go, all right, we're going to be, you know, how many people can make it to Deglo? How many people can make it to Jonesboro, Ledgestone, Champions Cup, all that stuff, and then just go from there. Um, but we need we need better rules and we need more consistent rules enforcement. If we're not gonna do like that's uh that's the part that's frustrating me the most is this selective application. Why? Why was this rule enforced, but not the caddy dress code on half the caddies out there? Those are dress code violations that you and your caddy, the the player and the caddy, are one and the same. So if the caddy has a violation, you have a violation, and you take that warning or stroke. You are responsible for your caddy, and you're treated the same. The only thing is, with a caddy, you don't need to be a PDGA member, and you don't have to pass the certifying rules exam, which we can all agree is stupid. And yes, this is growing pains of the sport, Thomas. It, it is. It is. But... If we don't call this crap out now, it's only going to get worse and worse and worse, which I feel like it's gotten worse since last year, and we need to get on it. Like, last year, when Drew Gibson called Gannon on his 30 seconds, everybody said he was the biggest jerk in the world. I don't think so. I mean, he was taking longer than his 30 seconds. He wasn't following the rules. And he says he's got better about that. I've only seen him on coverage the one time at Vegas, and he or uh, was it Vegas? And he played well. You know, I thought he did better about it. So it, that's the hard part with people. Like we're in this weird transition period where people like, uh, it wasn't Haley King, uh, Heather Young is reevaluating whether or not she wants to continue playing disc golf because arguably from when she joined a couple years ago, I don't remember when she started touring full time to now in 2022, the game has changed. The, the tour has changed so much in the last three, four years. It is completely different than it was. Social media is so much bigger. The paychecks are so much bigger from the companies, generally, unless you're at Innova. Uh, <laughs> but I digress. Um, and, and things have just changed. The tour is de more demanding than ever. You have to put in a lot more work. And the people who got in a couple years ago might not want to do that good bad or indifferent like heather young is a fantastic disc golfer but she might want to go back to something like chris dickerson used to do and be kind of that regional local tour or uh james proctor did or who's the other guy that does that um but y you guys get what i'm saying like maybe that's what you want to do and you can make some decent money just being a regional pro and maybe getting lucky and getting on some of those tour stops um I, my whole thought about the Silver Series is that needs to be the minor leagues to get into the Pro Tour, and we need to disincentivize the pros from coming down to play Silver Series. I know that's going to happen on occasion, but generally speaking, that's how it's going to go. Um, yeah, and, and it was I didn't know much about Heather Young. Uh, she seemed like she was super nice, really a uh, good player. Um, she was part of some of those, was it Prodigy commercials that were just terrible because they pulled in some of the pros to do, um, I think, I think it was when Chris Dickerson was there too. And those, some of those commercials were rough to say the least. Um, but I mean, you get what you pay for They don't want to, they want the people who are going to buy Prodigy are going to know at the time, Chris Dickerson, Heather Young, that kind of stuff. Um, or, you know, Dynamic Discs, I thought their commercials with their Dymax commercials were fine. That It made me chuckle the first time. The hard part is we're also seeing these commercials 8,000 times per round because there are no other commercials. I'm so thankful they've stopped playing the Holy Shot over and over and over and over again. 
I get it. It was part of a compilation for all the past major winners. Um, and that was fine. Like they showed Paul's big shot. They showed, you know, uh, Katrina Allen's big shot. They showed Paige Pierce tapping out and all that stuff. And I get it. And part of that compilation, that was fine. I get it. But when at the beginning of the season, that's all we were seeing by the pro tour and by MVP, MVP was getting a lot of free advertisement from the pro tour. But, uh, yeah, uh, this has turned into a fairly long episode here. Holy macaroni. I didn't know I was going to be able to talk for this long. Uh, I was about to get into talking about my match play event, but, um, I don't know. Uh, what do you, what do you guys think? Uh, played it this other day. Um, yes. And there, there is a bunch of good stuff out there week to week. Um, and I know it, it seemed like I was in the minority a little bit for the holy shot, but like it got to the point where it was starting to lose its effect and I was starting to get annoyed. And that's not what you want from a fantastic shot like that. But uh, yeah, I think, uh, I don't know, I could talk about a uh, match, local match play event, which was on Facebook Live. You could find it. I retweeted it. You could watch it. Um, took on Drew, not going to say his last name. Um, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, we played Tillman Whites uh, from on uh, to when Wednesday yesterday. Yesterday, holy crap! That was only yesterday. For those of you listening on Friday, that was two days ago. Math is fun. Uh, played really well. Putting has been on fire. Like I said before, practice your putting. Throw for show, putt for dough has truly come through. Last year, I ended up losing it. Uh, because I choked with my putting pretty much it. That's, that's as simple as it goes. But on that happy note, <laughs> I'm in the final four again for the second year straight. And technically, so going into the elite eight, there were three people tied with seven wins. This tournament's only been around for two years. It is an NCAA bracket style, random draw seeds. I was in a three-way tie with seven wins. Those are the most wins from everybody um one of the guys was who won it last year he got knocked out already i didn't play him um he's the guy who beat me last year so you know i always say if you're gonna get beat get beat by the winner uh, and that's ncaa that's any playoffs uh another guy who's on the other side of the bracket for me had se has seven wins to my knowledge he has not played yet and then there's myself who now has eight wins so technically for a couple days I have the most wins, unless he loses. I don't know. That's all in technicalities, and I love technicalities. Technically, I was the best. You know, Cal Naughton Jr. won his first race because he didn't get out of his car. He was in third place, but technically, he won that race. Talladega. If you ain't first, you're last. And on that note, I'm not sure what to do with my hands right now. The car was like a spaceship. Um... Thank you all for watching. I've been Joe. You've been awesome. If you get a great tree kick back into the fairway, you need to thank Treesus. And if you get kicked deeper into the woods, well, you need to reflect and repent because you have transgressed against Treesus. Thank you all for watching, and I can't wait to see you all in the next episode.